Welcome to Living Mirrors with Dr. James Cook. My guest this week is Darren LeBaron. Darren is an organic horticulturalist, food enterprise tutor, educator, and event organizer based in the UK. He's a keen mushroom cultivator and has been growing gourmet and medicinal mushrooms for over a decade. He teaches an online shroom shop masterclass where he teaches the art of mushroom cultivation, and he's the mycologist in residence at London's Somerset House. Darren is also a qualified permaculture teacher and facilitator and supports businesses and communities in creating sustainable working systems and environments. He is a member of London's Psychedelic Society, where he presents regularly, and is also a chair and committee member for the Psychedelic Conference Breaking Convention. Today, we talk about psilocybin mushrooms and what humans can learn from mushrooms in general. Hope you enjoy the conversation. Okay, I'm here with Darren LeBaron. Darren, thanks for coming on the podcast. Happy to be here, James. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so maybe we can start with a bit of the kind of the deep background on how you first came to work with psychedelics. Um, I would say, like, in all honesty, it's like kind of been like a lifelong journey that I was unaware of. <laughs> but um, with that said, you know, I've always been interested in kind of like ancient history, culture, indigenous practices. And that's from teenage years and moving through into my 30s, I was still delving into various practices and research, you know, areas. And psychedelics have come up a few times, you know, as something serious to study. <laughs> And I realized the only way to study psychedelics was to partake in psychedelics. Um, most of my knowledge up until that time around psychedelics was based on what the media had provided, which was pretty much a negative, negative connotations associated with psychedelics. And then the white guys I used to go to school with, man, those were the first people to bring psychedelics into my consciousness as something that they were doing at the weekends. And then um, they were popping pills or doing mushrooms or acid and going up to Hampstead Heath and um, and talking to aliens and talking to trees and stuff. And I thought they were crazy. And, you know, so my early introductions were not, you know, were not supported by anything that gave me any foundations. Like, well, this is something, you know, culturally appropriate, you know, for somebody like myself being of black heritage in the United Kingdom by way of the Caribbean. Like, it, just, it just didn't all, it just never connected. But then I was in my 30s, you know, as I said, I stumbled across it again. And um, I met up with somebody called Kalindi E, who became a friend, teacher, brother of mine, who's no longer here. But, um, and he was very supportive of, you know, when I was at that early stage, I was just trying to find out and learn more. And he was an advocate for psychedelics. He was the only person I knew on planet earth that was talking about psychedelics, but also, you know, related to African people. So those were kind of the things that moved me. That was around 2010, 2011. And um, yeah, I just kind of continued doing the research and independent studies moving forward. Oh, very cool. Yeah, I mean, I think with Kalindi and yourself, I think, like, is it true that you uh, first saw him talk at the first Breaking Convention conference? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I think, I mean, back then I remember, you know, I think the uh, there was a real issue around representation, you know, people of colour speaking. I, I, he was probably one of the very few people back then, right? And it seems that people are kind of, you know, things are moving in a positive direction here. And was that really important for you then, as you say, like, the, there was actual representation uh, it's a kind of like a role model that you could see of someone actually in this space. Most definitely, you know, again, I was familiar with Kalindi's work actually, like for decades, he'd been teaching about martial arts. He's a master martial artist. So, and he talks about African fighting sciences and, you know, the origins of martial arts coming from Africa. So all of this type of information he was, he was sharing, putting out there. And in 2011, when he said that he was coming to the UK for his breaking convention, this psychedelic conference, which is the very first one, and me, I was very naive as well. And I was like, you know, highly inspired. I'd had my first, you know, experiences around that time and was going to this conference. And there was, you know, up to nearly 100 speakers there. And Kalindi was the only person of African heritage that was presenting about psychedelics. And um, out of maybe up to a thousand people in attendance, I was probably the only black person male in attendance. So for me, as much as I gleaned so much knowledge and information and inspiration from being there, there was like large gaps just as far as the information that I also was interested in, you know, the role psychedelics played in the Caribbean or Africa, you know, or other indigenous cultures. And, you know, there was a lack of people who were speaking about it, especially those who came from those places. So for me, that was a question, you know, that came up. But um, it wasn't an issue. In all honesty, it, was, it wasn't an issue for me. What I was inspired to then do off the back of that was just start curating events where 
I would invite those speakers who have got something to say on that subject who, you know, people can relate to as well as, you know, are able to, you know, get access to, you know, because a lot of these conferences, as you know, are hundreds of pounds in, in thousands in some cases and it, people don't get access. So for me, it was like, let's just bring it down to the ground, make sure that everyday people can get access to the, to the same knowledge and information. And we started putting on stuff. And that was the way forward for me and working with Kalindi, like I'm going to help put on events alongside you as well as instigate and open up doors and opportunities for you with conferences or festivals or anywhere else where they're looking for speakers so that yeah that was how I kind of yeah worked in solving or you know addressing that yeah right and then if you fast forward to 2019 I was at the breaking convention then and you were involved in putting on this like, psychedelic Africa panel right which was an amazing array of speakers including Kalindi right yeah, that's right so yeah it was interesting because as I said the very first convention in 2011 I was there as a participant I bought a ticket attended you know at the time of my life and then by the following breaking convention which was two years later I was just involved in creating um, Kalindi basically so that we were trying to get more speakers but literally around the world there was no one really speaking about this stuff and um, I was just helping do his slides and coordinate stuff and then one of the organizers asked if I would present out the following breaker convention i was like no i don't present i just you know help organize and i'm kind of more behind the scenes and um i ended up committing to that further down the line she twisted my arm and um i presented at the following breaking convention two years later and then two years later because breaking convention is a biannual event i was involved in curating a panel you know and that led on to what you would have seen in 2019 where every other year i helped support in bringing speakers from around the world from you know the African continent as well as the diaspora talk about psychedelics and you know it's been really well received over the years that I've been you know holding that responsibility with the breaking convention and yeah I continue to do that work yeah I, mean, I was lucky enough to have a chat with uh, Clindy uh, back in 2019 before he passed away and um at that conference and we were talking about like, he's you know he has a lot of interesting wisdom and perspectives, but uh, he's, uh, you could say he's most well known for the, he's taking these incredibly large doses, right? Like five times a heroic dose up to kind of 50 grams of dried mushrooms. And he was talking about, I was asking if it's, if he felt it was kind of similar to DMT experiences. And he, he said basically, yes, that, you know, this kind of complete feeling of going to another world. Right. But, um, I mean, I imagine, you know, there's a lot to his work, right? It's not just the, <laughs> the huge dose thing. He wasn't someone who was just advocating everyone goes and does these gigantic doses. Right. Most definitely not. You know, I was a student of it, so um, I had direct one-to-one -one as well as group two tutelage from Kalindi. So I know the school of thought and, you know, um, you know the premise for partaking in psychedelics, as you know, about set, set and intention. All these frameworks are in place as well, you know, that support our culture and our approach. You know, and it was it would have been suggested that you start a low, a low dose that you decide, you know, you do your research and get some kind of understanding. If you want to start with one gram, if you want to start three grams, if you want to jump in at five grams, you know, you're going to have to do the research and find that place and space. And there will be people around to support you with that. And then, so in general, we start at five grams. That's where we would start, you know, the experience for people. We know that that's really what gets the wheels turning for, for most of the folks that we work with doses below that threshold just don't really you know support people come back from there just saying oh, i needed to take more of, you know you know after going through the four six hour journey you know so if you've got the support there you know you get the support to go through those processes so you would be going through that at least three times minimum with the support of somebody at that you know lower dosage and then you would work your way up an increment in stages you know like every you know if you start five then you do a seven gram do seven grams a few times you know till you fill that out and get comfortable with that then you might go up to nine grams and you go through your nine gram process which might take years you know it's not like oh now i've done five grams the next time i do seven grams the next time i do no it's like you feed it out a few times each grammage that you increase by maybe a year two years that you go through before you increase to the next stage you know it's basically at your rate as we say we we allow the technology to teach you inspire you if you feel you need to be going in on a monthly basis on the full moon or you know you create a, a, a rites of passage for yourself in engaging with the mushrooms we really feel that the technology supports you in that. So if you're not somebody who's inspired to take high doses, we would say, well, that's not what that's not what you do, you know. Um, for those of us who do, we do realize and 
from different perspectives, persuasions, because we're all different and how we experience it is different. But I always use the premise of, you know, to get, you know, from point A to point B, for example, say if I'm in London and I've got to get to Scotland, I need enough fuel in my tank, in my car to get me get, get me up there. I might need to actually refuel my tank. It might not be to get me directly up there in comparison to if I live in London, which I do, and I've just got to get to the other side of London. I may not need as much fuel in the tank as if I need to get to Scotland. So depending on where you're journeying to, with the realms that you decide that you would prefer to navigate on a particular journey, you may want to put enough fuel in the tank to get yourselves places and spaces. And then, yes, they are more like a... DMT experience those higher dosages at a, for a four to six hour period rather than a 15 20 minute type experience so it takes you through various phases of the experience that lower dosages just don't allow you to experience the mushroom in that way right and I think the point you made about that Glendy would would do this in a very kind of supported environment is, is really important because you know you mentioned starting at five and for me five was my first kind of intentional mushroom uh, trip and well, it was actually 50 fresh, but uh, that's yeah, roughly five dried, uh, not the 50 dried that Glindy would do, which I would never go near, I think, uh, for me personally. But I, um, so that was positive for me. But if we're talking about serious stuff here, right? As you're saying, we're talking about really giving up resistance and going on a big journey. And I think for a lot of people, um, you know, like in the studies, they work with similar doses, maybe equivalent to like four dried grams. Um, and, but again, you're really supported. So I think it's just, yeah, it's good that you flagged that. that this is not something to go into recklessly, right? With no, no preparation and just think five's a good place to start. Yeah, you would have never heard me or Kalindi or any one of us speak right. in that way whatsoever. So I know people just get the headlines and the highlights and just put that out there and say, you know, 50 grams, that's reckless. But Kalindi would always highlight, that's not what I do every time. You know, that would be once a year, once every other year, you know, the, those dosages. And, you know, there was a lot more to what he was talking to share about not just jumping in at 50 grams and there you go and he was like that's what i'm doing we know other people we've got young people women elders that are doing very similar dosages in you know in and around the community and around the world that we connect with and build with and talk with so he wasn't just the one-off guy he was just speaking publicly about it that's what you know highlighted his his position in particular yeah yeah he definitely definitely didn't come across as reckless like I, in that talk he was he was really emphatic i remember him saying like 50 grams is not fun. He, did, he said that a few times. He got kind of laugh from the audience because he was he, he meant it. You know, it's like this is not just like, you know, super fun, like roller coaster. This is like intense stuff. And he, you know, described himself as a kind of explorer of these kind of outer reaches of, of states of consciousness um, and definitely seemed to be doing it with that intention to, of, yeah, of someone very serious. I'm sure the same kind of serious mindset he, took, he approaches martial arts with. Yeah, I believe, you know, the, the two go hand in hand, they're complementary, the discipline required to become a master martial artist, I guess, can definitely support you in your entheogenic voyages too. And, um, you know, when I first heard Kalindi speak about psychedelics, this was on, you know, when there was VHSs, if you remember those, <laughs> it was a VHS video, and he was talking about, you know, magic mushrooms and ancient Egypt, but he was really highlighting as a master martial artist that, you know, martial arts come out of the mushrooms. The, the fighting sciences actually come out of their files that are in the mushroom experience, you know, and, um, you know, along with yoga and other practices, you know, that he was highlighting. And at the time, I was very new and naive, and I just thought this guy's taken way too many mushrooms. <laughs> mushroom bias, because everything comes out of mushrooms. But little did I know, and as I said, I was naive at the time to how much on, how on point he actually was as far as, you know, these practices that we have that have fallen from heaven or we've downloaded from, you know, the entheogenic realms that we apply now on earth were from the, the godly realms, you know, and, um, you know, that's what, you know, we attend, attain, attempt to do as a Christian, you know, you want to bring heaven on earth, you know, you know, the Our Father prayer, you know, it's the same in the, the religions and many other practices, it's bringing back what you can from these alter states of consciousness experiences, whether it's meditation, yoga, psychedelics, and they were psychedelics and mushrooms in particular were a catalyst for these religions and these spiritual systems. So Lindy spoke on that and opened my eyes to the connection or the, you know, as I said, that they're complementary. Yoga and mushrooms go together. Martial arts and mushrooms, they go together. Your Qigong and mushrooms, they go together. Very much complementary practices. Yeah. And you mentioned like all these different things you can bring back from the psychedelic state. And, you know, so 
when I first started experimenting with it, it was from a kind of like interest in things like meditation and, you know, spiritual insights. And then I very quickly realized that actually the main gift the mushrooms were giving me was the ability to kind of drop emotional burdens, you know, like healing work, basically becoming aware of stuff that I was not aware of just through kind of cultural conditioning, you know, uh, intergenerational trauma, all that stuff. Uh, and I felt like people, you know, people were, they're such flexible tools, right? People can have very different things that they're, they're good for for them. What would you say there was one main path that they kind of led you on? Yeah, I would say for me, um, I always highlight, I think the most important thing in my day-to-day -day life, because after all the voyages and experiences that you can have, you come back to London, you're in your bedroom, you're wherever you are, and it's like, what and how applicable are those experiences to my day-to-day -day life? And I could say immediately what I realized it was definitely supporting me with was lightening my load, you know, just as far as luggage and baggage that I carried around with me in my mind, you know, my inner self, you know, things that didn't serve me well, pathological problems, you know, depression, anxiety, things that I didn't think I had, like, and I've not been diagnosed clinically for those things, but just in your day-to-day -day life, like you see the condition in the program in a society, puts on you I realized how much of that had impacted me and stopped me from being me you know the, the, the yeah the me who is you know the me myself and I so it opened up that reality to lightening my load not having hang-ups and issues around things that you know bothered me at one point of time so that it lightened my load and it's freed me up James man it's made me feel and live a more liberated life and uh, uh, for all the amazing journeys that I've been on and things that I've encountered that were amazing, challenging and all of that, it's all down to that. I can get up in, up in the morning, I can get on with my life, what I'm doing, I'm feeling and I'm loving it and I'm enjoying it. And I've definitely been inspired by the mushrooms wholly in, you know, curating that lifestyle for myself. Yeah, that's great to hear. That's really <laughs> nice. um, so with, you mentioned that... Uh, Kalindi was really kind of he, he, psilocybin mushrooms were his main kind of thing, right? Is that for you as well? Were they your main kind of psychedelic? Yeah, much so simply because it's what I feel comfortable with, what I can get access to, what I can cultivate. You know, it makes it a very sustainable practice for me, you know, utilizing mushrooms. You know, obviously there's a multiple amount of psychedelics out there at the moment that people have got access to. And uh, my thing and where or approach has been, you know, when the, when the technology calls you, it calls you, you know? So I've had experiences with other technologies, but um, because of the role that mushrooms play, and as I said, due to the ability to cultivate them, put your energy and your intentions into it, you know, not buying it just off, you know, off the black market randomly, not knowing what you're getting, all those aspects make you feel really comfortable with mushrooms. You know, I always say that mushrooms are the gift of planet Earth. You know, you need to be from the Amazon to be gifted ayahuasca, you know, to be a gatekeeper of that technology. That's where you need to be from. That's where nature, God, whatever you have, you see, it, gifted that technology to that region. You know, if you're talking about Iboga, you're, you're only going to find that in Central Africa, you know, and that's that was who the, it was gifted to. Those are the gatekeepers. Those are the people who hold the information around the, that plant technology. So we should respect and appreciate what that technology and those people who it was gifted to have to say about it. No different from Salve de Venorum. You're only going to find that in Mexico. So I understand that there's specific people, groups who hold, who have been gifted that technology. And we should just respect and appreciate, you know, if they choose to share it with us and how we go about doing that, being very respectful and resourceful. With that said, mushrooms, where do you find them? All over the planet, man. They're like, they're the, they're, they are the gift, you know, they are the gift for all of us. And um, they're the oldest, you know, they've been here and been doing what they've been doing way before plants were even thinking about doing what they're doing. And um, they're still here for us. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a mushroom guy and advocate. I'm into eating mushrooms as well as gourmet mushrooms, medicinal mushrooms. I'm very inspired by the role that mushrooms have played and continue to play being you know, a, a very important resource for planet Earth, this organism that we live on and how it operates and functions wouldn't be happening without mushroom technology. So yeah, I understand mushrooms to be really important and I'm passionate about them. And yeah, that's why I'm, as a psychedelic, that's why they would be my chosen psychedelic too. Right. And is it right that you had a background in horticulture before you even got into psychedelics? 
Yeah, that's right. That's right. So um, I came actually came from a creative arts background. I was into music and filmmaking and stuff and horticulture and food growing was just a personal interest hobby of mine. And um, but I got the opportunity to be educated and trained by some real cool people in London that organically. And um, we supported each other in developing like a young people's programs and stuff like that and educational packages around food growing and food enterprise for young people who were, you know, the hard, so-called hard to reach, you know, been kicked out of school, just come out of prison, you know, unemployed and work with them in developing food enterprise projects. So by day I was teaching organic food growing, you know, in schools, colleges, pupil referral units and that type of um, yeah, those type of education or institutions uh, where you find young people. And um, yeah, I continued to do that, got into permaculture, and that got me more and more into mycology and teaching people how to cultivate mushrooms as well. So yeah, that all kind of, yeah. Yeah. And I remember, I think it was a few years ago, the first um, thing I, like, I think it was an interview, first time I came across your work. I seem to remember you talking about taking these kids out of kind of who would spend their all their childhood in kind of in the city of London, taking them out mm-hmm. to a forest and just them becoming kind of more just more free and kind of childlike. Is that was that's, that your experience? That's right, just like adults, you know. <laughs> you know, you get them out of their comfort zone, out of the concrete jungle, you get them out in nature, it puts a smile in your face, you get more relaxed, you feel more in, more in tune with yourself more connected with nature you know all you need to do is touch a tree touch the ground walk barefoot so it was a challenge in getting young people initially out of the community their local community to you know certain places and spaces but we made sure that was facilitated in our programs that they were supporting getting so if you ask the young people well come from Hackney and find make your way up to Chingford they're probably not going to make their way up to Chingford they'll find something else to do on the way that distracts them from making their way but if you go pick them up put them in a mini bus take them down or jump on a train and let get them to have that experience that in itself was part of the you know the opening up of the strong young people tough young people bad boy gangster wannabe young people that I would have been working with but you get them on the train you take them up from Hackney to Chingford you know on that journey it starts to become more green start seeing that they get into somewhere that's a bit more rural they feel they're in the countryside although we're only up the road in Wolfham Forest you know and by the time they enter the forest because we've got the option of coming out of the train station and jumping on the bus to the side but on a good day we would take them on a walk through the forest because the forest was basically at the edge of um, Epping Forest so taking them that journey off the train which they're already excited about and then we've got them to the forest and their first step into the forest the first things they see you know all just kind of brand new to them um, you see the child come out, man. You see that bad boy, that one of these gangsters dissolve, and they're like, "Look at the butterflies! Oh, sir, look, there's a worm. Can we eat these? Are these edible? Are they poisons?" They start asking those curious questions again, and you know, and then you get them more engaged in some of the activities that they still are not really trying to do. They don't want to be gardeners and food growers, so we've got to find interesting ways, and we've done that through food enterprise, giving them tangible alternatives, ways to make money, generate an income for yourself that you can be proud of, that your parents will be proud of, rather than selling drugs and getting caught up in the things they were getting caught up in. Right. I think that idea of, of people getting involved in in really taking control of their own food, you know, production, like getting interested in permaculture, if you can kind of growing your own food is really important. I think I think I saw an interview with you where you mentioned um part of the inspiration for you to get involved in this stuff was visiting Barbados and having some some cousins who are about five years old who owned a bit of land and were doing gardening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, all of that yeah was really important, man. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing now. Like yeah. where I'm at in my life is really inspired by those guys because they were, as you mentioned, really young, five, six, seven years old at the time and were in they knew how to grow food. And I didn't. I was in my 30s and I didn't have a clue, you know, what they were talking about. And to be educated in that way, knowing that that's where I actually come from, that's where my family come from. I thought, you know, I was so disconnected from that. And um, that's what inspired me to come back to London and actually start educating myself around food. I had a garden, I wanted to grow food, but I knew I could just put the seeds in the ground and see what happened. And I tried that. But I thought I really do need to learn how to nurture these plants. And I saw those young children that... I met my nieces and nephews and cousins and they were very much like qualified more than I getting certificates now to get the qualification, but they were just qualified through that's just was their way of life, man. And they knew about it. They knew about the stars, man, and just when to sow the seeds was depending on where the stars were in the sky. I'm like, how did how do you know this stuff, man? <laughs> so yeah, like I mean that that was a big inspiration for me wanting to get my head around more of that. 
So then yeah. I could then be educated in London. I could return to Barbados and get to those. They were probably like 10, 11 by that time. And I could show off a little and be like, yeah, I just finished my course. And um, I know a bit about food growing now. They were just, just laughing me out of the room. <laughs> yeah, I think mushrooms in particular are really um, well suited to pushing people in this direction or guiding people in this direction to realizing how connected we are and that we're part of nature, right? Like, um, I think you could, yeah, people often, if you grow up in a city, you have this idea that, well, this is a drug, right? It's a, it might come from nature, but it contains a drug and, and you're taking it, you know, a drug when you take some like mushrooms. But another way to look at it is, if, imagine if you're out in a forest and you're, you know, having a microdose of mushrooms. To me, that feels far more, rather than thinking of it as I'm taking this chemical, it's like I'm engaging with nature, right? It's being, it grows out of the earth here. I'm in the forest. And same way when you play with a dog, you know, you don't try and come up with some reductionist explanation. You're like, no, I'm engaging organism to organism. <laughs> We're spending time together and all this beautiful stuff is happening. Um, it definitely puts you in that mindset of... Uh, of seeing the importance of you know connecting to nature through growing your own food through just spending time in nature as well mm. yeah no, i agree i think it's really important you know I, I always have to remind people that say you know i need to connect with nature i want to get connected with nature and i'm like you know you are nature like you are <laughs> nature like there's no connecting to it you know you're connected whether you like it or not or know it or not and there are definitely ways that you can enhance that relationship like any other relationship you know so the more you invest in it the more you get back from it so taking times out go on a forest walk or just walk if you don't have access to a local forest just getting out there man just being conscious of i remind people i grew up in a concrete jungle you know east london surrounded pretty much by concrete my local forest at the time you know a car drive away a bus ride away so get out on a day-to-day basis and be surrounded by concrete may not be considered as very natural or nature-like but um if you've got a windowsill if you've got a balcony if you've got a landing that you can introduce some plants grow some herbs you know whatever you like to eat then you grow it, you know, it's like really simple and straightforward. These are different ways. And it's really simple having a sunflower in your house, you know, a daffodil, you know, just engaging with an organism, just one thing, you will see the rewards that you can gain from that, man. So even getting a mushroom grow kit, they've been trending recently, you know, coming off the shelves and different, you know, productions now providing people the opportunity to get a kit and grow mushrooms at the home. They take off the shelf and people are utilising, you know, in, in urban settings, way to connect with nature. So, yeah, it's really important, man, to remember yeah. that you are nature, you're connected, even concrete is nature, you know, if that's your nature, that's your environment, and you're going to learn to adapt and work with it and find a way. That's what permaculture teaches, you know, so... I try to bring some of that as well as the ancient wisdom in teaching and reminding people who they are. Right. Would you be able to say a bit about uh, kind of what permaculture is uh, for anyone who doesn't know? Uh, so again, permaculture means different things to different people. So it really depends on who you're talking to. But it's, you know, the key word would be sustainability, man. It's about creating systems, creating, you know, working models that are sustainable, you know, for the individual who's creating the system, anybody who's going to participate in the system, you know, and the byproduct of it. But it needs to be sustainable. And there's different um, tools and principles and ethics that we utilize in creating these models or checking in on any ideas you may have so for example say if you've got a garden like i did i've got a garden i've got i've never had a garden before don't really know what i'm doing and darren just wants to grow strawberries because i love strawberries and i'm just thinking about myself at that time and i'm not really finding out what's going on in the garden because the garden already is communicating stuff so you might get to a garden that's been left unattended for a year and the first thing most of us would do without any knowledge would be well let me clear the garden let me clear out all the weeds and start growing the food that i want to grow but permaculture teaches you that no in fact those weeds are actually functioning have roles one they're communicating stuff with us you know dandelions for example which might be an invasive weed for most people is actually telling us that we've got real fertile soil we've got a clay soil type you know it's letting us know because it's only going to grow in certain environments so Permaculture teaches you to read and observe before you jump in and decide to do anything. Because what we found out in the world that we're currently living in, a lot of times we just dive in head first. We're going to just build this building. And when the building starts leaning to the side or the roof start, you know, falling apart through a wind, it's like we've not really surveyed and understood what we're doing and the impact that it's going to have on the environment and so forth. So permaculture is about that. It teaches you to see what's going on first find out what clay type you've got and then introduce plants that are complementary to what's already there, not 
are your ideas of you want to bring this and changing things around. That's not sustainable. So that's what permaculture really inspires growers to do. But you can also apply, apply it in your day to day life and make your lifestyle more sustainable if you choose to. Right. And I mean, it seems like permaculture, you know, I mean, in one sense, it's been around forever, right? And kind of indigenous farming techniques. But, you know, the term permaculture came along after the 60s, right? And it, it seems to me like there is a connection here with the psychedelics that, um, you know, it's, it's hard to notice it because there's so much, you know, so much wrong with our with our culture. But if you think about, you know, the fact that now so many people are interested in uh, eating organic food, doing yoga, you know, meditation is becoming more mainstream. If you compare that to like the West in the 50s before kind of LSD, you know, hit the mainstream, I, it does sometimes make me feel like we are living in a kind of quite a psychedelic culture. Like the, the influence is there from the hippie movement in the 60s. It's still not the, the full on mainstream. But compared mm. to life in the 50s, you know, like it gives me some optimism that like people get this stuff, you know, they have these trailblazers who were seen as weirdos at the time for their, you know, eating healthy organic food and, and doing yoga. And now it's like people gradually are kind of catching up. And it seems to me that, you know, permaculture is, is kind of part of that. And I think it's something that we I think it's probably going to be really at the root of any significant social change is like, you know, we were talking earlier about feeling grounded in nature um, and how kind of healing that can be. And the way we the way we engage with the natural world and the way we get our food is so foundational to how we organize ourselves socially. I mean, you know, it's probably a bit, bit much for a lot of people to imagine a kind of back to the land thing where everyone's trying to grow their own food. But I think something like that has to be part of any any positive change socially. Yeah, um, I'm totally with you on that. Um, you know, my premise and it's just, you know, my perspective is um, and but understand is that, you know, the part of the world that we're in, the Western world, let's call it, is pretty much in its infancy stage, man. Like, this is what I've come to understand that if you, you know, just, you know, applying permaculture, for example, like you said, it's something that you find those principles and practices are in indigenous and ancient cultures, you know, and practice till this day. So these things are not new. And what you find out is that a lot of these ancient indigenous cultures, psychedelics is at the premise of who they are and what they do on a day to day, you know, on a day to day tip. And um, the way they utilize and have incorporated these practices has been because what most of these cultures have, would say is that we're or more, we've matured. We've gone through what you guys are about to go through, <laughs> you know, and, you know, we thought we were the most important. We were at the top of the hierarchy on planet Earth. You know, we were the bosses, you know, we ran the world. But at that same time, we started to reconnect and appreciate the power of nature, because if nature decides to throw us off, <laughs> nature can easily just throw us off, you know, in many different ways. So um, they live a very simple life after creating high civilizations for the most part in all of their teachings they talk about at some point being you know part of high civilizations that realize that to build you've got to destroy so the more you build the more you destroy so rather than keep trying to build and we keep destroying and making things worse that like, let's just keep things really simple and live the simple life and just be down with nature and you know like because nature provides us with everything that we need we don't need more than that so in this part of the world, I think we're going through that and we're going to get back to the tree hugging and, oh, trees, we've missed you. We've missed feeling so connected to you. But if you understand that those folks who are in the jungle, in the rainforest, they're with the trees every day and they know the power of them and they respect and appreciate what they have to bring. So I think that in this part of the world, in this season, this psychedelic renaissance is just that for this part of a story for a particular groups of people in particular parts of the world. But there's some other people, they got it already, man. They got it tens of thousands of years ago and you know and they you know if, if you leave them to their own devices they, they do all right man as primitive or backwards or whatever you want to think they may be when you leave them to their own devices they're all right man they they do they do pretty much all right by themselves yeah i think that's a great point that you know the fact that we're told from the mic from the uh, perspective of kind of western culture whatever you want to call it it's you know these people are they're sustainable wise ways of living in balance with the environment and that's somehow primitive and backward and as it, and the story we're told is that they just haven't got to the stage of development yet where they figured out how to do this stuff but then you know you learn about i mean right you're in uh quite near kind of mississippi at the moment right and um around there there was a civilization you know of a fully centralized kind of mississippi mound civilization in the americas before you know uh kind of collapsed around the time the europeans got there and so it's not that 
you know, when people, when Europeans connected with Native Americans, it's not that these people had never had the idea to do kind of mass agriculture and build massive, you know, structures. Like they, they experimented with it, and then it kind of it seems they'd learn to wisely. Like, okay, there are limits to that. You know, we actually it turns out you end up damaging the ecosystem. This is a wiser way to live, more a more advanced way to live, right? There you go. There you go, man. So you live and you learn. Yeah, exactly. Well, ho- hopefully, uh, I mean that's the thing. I used to think. Um, you know, my first thought there was like with uh, the kind of ecological crisis and stuff like, will we live and learn? But we will, like humans will make it through in some form or another. <laughs> and hopefully uh, we'll take these kinds of lessons. I think that's the thing is no matter what happens in future, um, even if even if integrating principles of permaculture and sustainability doesn't avert a lot of catastrophes, it needs to be there in the culture for the aftermath, for whatever humans rebuild after <laughs> any kind of challenges we face. It, it's never a bad idea to, uh, to to kind of learn to live wisely, right, in balance with your environment. Most definitely, most definitely. Um, well, we're just going to get composted, man. We're just going to compost, you know, like, we just, you know, how it happens in, you know, nature and earth just starts all over again. It's always, yeah. just, you know, like, and, you know, we would have, would have just missed out on an opportunity to be part of Earth's story for longer than we currently are because, you know, we're just messing things up. And, you know, just like the cordyceps mushroom that, you know, and balance out nature by being a parasitic fungi can attack particular bugs and ants and so forth, but, you know, allow nature to balance itself out because if a particular bug overruns the forest and it's putting things out of out of sync, then the mushrooms come in and just, you know, take, <laughs> take them out basically. So things come back into balance. And, you know, I'm often asked, do you think what humans are doing with mushrooms, you know, come and handle business in the same way they do it with other forms of nature? And I'm pretty sure that they would and they will and they're going to if we don't sort our shit out, man. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think that's like the mushrooms are a real inspiration. I think like they it really brings together so many different things like, um, you know, you're talking about composting and like, re, you know, mushrooms, as you know, kind of break things down to de- decompose things. Right. And when I, you know, in, in kind of psychedelic states and in these kinds of um, ecological spiritualities you might find in indigenous communities, there's often like a sense of time that's this kind of like circular like existence is this churn, right? We're not really actually, we're not really going anywhere. It's not about linear time and progress and we're going to build and build and build and accelerate like we do in our culture that's kind of crazed, you know, um, but instead it's like this, this more nurturing circular, you know, composting spirituality, you could say, where like you realize, yeah, we see right with the mushrooms, people overcome their fear of death because they, they end up identifying with nature and they think, well, okay, once my body dies, I, with my expanded sense of self, getting outside of my little egoic head and identifying with nature, I'll still be here. The show will still go on, right? Um, mm. So I think, do you find that ins- mushrooms are particularly kind of inspiring uh, in this area? Yeah, man. I know, you know, I don't know how people take it, but, you know, I've learned more from a compost heap about spirituality <laughs> than I have yeah. on most mainstream teachings that you're going to get about spirituality, you know, like just as far as observing and knowing that mushrooms, my seeding is the magic behind composting and renewing and recycling you know it's not nature's recyclers but um to know that you know you can observe a compost heap you can put a banana peel on that compost heap you know and just see it disappear and transform and become something else that then feeds new life to know that it just doesn't stop you know and just and you can keep that going and just knowing that if we we if we work with nature rather than against it we could be immortal where it's forever and that's what a compost heap has taught me and that's what spirituality and I guess the Jesus mythos and the Krishna mythos is all about and resurrection and you know rebirth and all these kind of things. I, I see and I've learned it. I'm observing the compost heap now for sure. So yeah, definitely. And knowing that the magic, the mycelium is the technology behind that transformation. And you know, that's what happens in you know mummification, and that's what happens in that you know, caterpillar transforming into that cocoon state into a butterfly to metamorphosize into something else. This is what we do and we'll continue to do that's what that's what i've observed what nature does so <laughs> we're part of that so that's what's going to happen to us i guess <laughs> yeah i mean that the um thing we we're saying earlier about like uh humans developing and evolving to learn to live wisely and balance the environment it almost feels like mycelium you know the kind of fungus organism is the is the logical endpoint of that it's like the most wise uh living thing there is it's just this really simple right single cell thick like really elegant organism that somehow just 
takes care of everything. Like, you know, if you look in a forest ecosystem with all the composting and distributes nutrients to the trees. And like, if, if there is like an, if there was an alien, like a super advanced alien species, it might look like a mushroom. <laughs> well, it is. And you are, it, it is you. <laughs> like, that's what we've got to come to terms with. You know, I've got one of my recent presenta- presentations um, that I've been delivering here while in the States is, um, you are a mushroom having a human experience, you know, and, um, and your ancestors are mushrooms and they're ancient and they're aliens too. And they traveled far from the depths of outer space to the realms of, you know, earth to came to come and insert and colonize the planet and take it over. And we live on a, basically a mushroom planet, James, you know, that's what I've come to terms with, you know, mushrooms, as I said, came as that arriving from outer space on their spacecraft and their ufos which were meteorites and asteroids and stuff came to earth they were the first living organism to make it out of the water onto the land they were the first to touch down and be like yo what are we going to do with this place and they took it over you know they wrapped that mycelium thread around the planet breaking down that bedrock allowing the first layers of soil to come through and allowing the first primitive plants 500 million years later to start becoming and evolving and millions of years later you've got human beings and we're here just a big part of this project that they've been developing for millennia for millennia yeah, millions of years now man yeah i mean the uh i mean terrence mckenna used to talk about uh the fact that um a spore that can you know can create a kind of fungus uh, can exist in the vacuum of space. It can exist. It can live in, you know, this kind of incredible cold. And, and so I know he was a fan of that idea um, that perhaps, you know, mushrooms would have some extraterrestrial origin. And scientists, you know, like um, Francis Crick, the you know Nobel Prize winning guy who discovered structured DNA, he was inter- he argued that life had been seeded from <laughs> another planet. So to some people, this would sound really out there, but it's 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 interesting to kick these ideas around because uh, they're not as implausible as they seem once you start to poke around. <laughs> Definitely not. And I'm one of those nerds, man. So I hear those things. I'm into mythology. It sounds like sci-fi. I know. Yeah. But you'd be surprised how serious this is being taken by the top scientists around the world, the NASA's of the world and so forth. And even more recently, the BBC, along with NASA, have been reporting so much stuff. And I won't get into it, but little things like little things like water's not even from Earth. The water that we have on planet Earth is alien, you know, it's like, it's not, you know, it came down in these big ice blocks from outer space, you know, and it's like, you right. start looking at, you know, even they discovered THC on meteorites <laughs> that were from, you know, it's just like, it starts getting beyond <laughs> Earth. It's, it's more to our Earth story than just Earth, you know, like, and yeah, we're part of the solar system, we're part of a Milky Way, you know, and it, then there's connections there, man, and there's cycles that overlap and bring us to a point where the mushrooms have been on a voyage and on a journey, and they're now part of Earth story, and you know, Earth story is a mushroom story too, you know, and it, it interrupts and interconnects, and more recently, um, you've got Paul Stamets, so I know many people may be familiar with, along with Elon Musk and NASA, who have been looking at um, inoculating asteroids in space with mycelium that will be able to break down the asteroids to start forming soil so they can start creating habitats on these asteroids so when they start sending their spaceships and passengers to mars because it's a very long journey so it's further than scotland so we're going to need more fuel in the tank to get there but to get all the way there we might need some you might need might need to lay over somewhere you're going to be laying over on some asteroids um, that have been inoculated with mushrooms to create soil so that they can then create these habitats and environments where the astronauts can hang out and various passengers. But it, we're just coming full circle, because as I mentioned, that's exactly what the spores when they came to Earth, what they've done here, and I guess what they've been doing in other places and spaces, I guess. I don't know how unique Earth is, but they might have been navigating through these vacuums and ending up in other places and doing a very similar process, but just in different environments producing other things. So. That's kind of weird and far out there, but there is a scientific term known as panspermia that people can go and check out. So it's not just a sci-fi movie thing that you see in Star Trek and stuff. It's panspermia, you can go check that out. You can go and check out the work of Paul Stamets and NASA and the work that they're doing. And I guess these guys really know what they're doing. So if they really know what they're doing, check them out. This stuff isn't just some weird mushroomy, hippie, weird stuff. It's real science, man. It's really out there. Yeah, yeah, it was panspermia that Francis Crick was uh, was arguing for, and um, it's a great uh, it's a great point about like I guess like terraforming other, you know, whether it's Mars or an asteroid. When people think of that, I guess they might usually think of like green like trees and plants and stuff that will give oxygen into the air that we can breathe. But we know that you know 
these trees can't survive without the mycelium that basically decompose everything for it to find, shuttle all the nutrients around. So mushroom science would really be at the core, I reckon, of, of any any project like that. There you go. They, then we start <laughs> realizing how important these guys are. That like, yeah. why do we not know about it? Why is it, yeah. you know, not being taught? Why do we know so much about plants? We know how important plants are. I grow plants. I love plants too. But if you know that ninety percent of the plants on Earth would have no existence without mushrooms, wouldn't be able to operate, and those other ten percent pretty much wouldn't be able to satisfy the humans and all the animals on planet Earth as we know it. Just know that it's a wrap. This is a mushroom planet. They run the planet. They keep it. It's the internet. It's the neurological pathway, brain system, the central nervous system. All of those, it mirrors all of those functions that keep all the things alive on, on planet Earth, basically, man. Yeah. You know, you eat the mushrooms, it makes your immune system stronger. You know, we can eat the plastic on planet Earth with the mushrooms. You know, with all the problems that we've got, we can clean up polluted waters, you know, polluted soils, re-green deserts, re-green asteroids. You know, like it's limitless to what this technology provides. So, yeah, when you get passionate about it, and you see what it brings and you know that that's why, you know, you've got people like myself and others that are, you know, like yeah, it's all about mushrooms, man. Yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah. a great question as to why our culture is it like doesn't teach us about mushrooms or isn't interested in it. Like, it's not much funding for mushroom, you know, science compared to other, you know, studying plants and things like that. And I guess it makes me kind of if I bring it back to the uh, thing we were talking about before that, you know, I think the you could argue that one of the biggest problems for our culture is the shift from a kind of ecological composting spirituality of like understanding us to be ourselves to be part of nature in which case you don't get you don't fear death through to a kind of like this linear like no we're going to improve we're going to keep going you can think of that as kind of coming out of a fear of death of like i'm gonna we're gonna keep improving and make life better we're gonna elongate the lifespan and and in that case if that's if at the root of our culture is this fear of death it kind of makes sense as to why we're not interested in the decomposers we're not interested in the composting kind of species right we we find mold gross and we don't want to go anywhere near it we don't we don't you know take become curious about it yeah man no you're on it james man i need to hear more from you man you're inspiring me <laughs> so, like, yeah. so i'm here to remind people as well like not only are you a mushroom having a human experience you're just a big piece of shit as well man. <laughs> like, that's where we come from that's where everything goes back to as a soul scientist you know I really appreciate the role of soil, you know. We can say things like ashes to ashes, dust to dust, we come from the soil, we go back to the soil, you know. And then when you realise that everything functioning in the soil is just pretty much eating each other shit. The bigger things eat food, organic matter, they poo it out, smaller things come behind that, eat that waste, process it, refine, tune it, and then you've got brand new soil, you've got new life for the plants, and then we keep that stuff going again. And that's really how important it is, you know, as far as, Farmyard manure, cow manure, we know that. That's why, or maybe we don't all know, that's why cow cults and bull cults around the world who consider cows and bulls sacred isn't just because they provided milk, meat, and manure. There was a gift that was gifted to them by way of the cow pies. Their number twos and those mushrooms that we grown on those cow pies were the gift. And anything else that was coming from that shit, no, whether it be the dung beetle or the scarab beetle that would roll up and create a micro universe or micro world and new life would come from those worlds from that shit ball along with mushrooms it played a really symbiotic relationship between mushrooms and shit and from the worst of the worst we could say from the filthiest the grotesque you get some of the most divine things in life man most divine experiences what about that so yeah these are some of the notions that allow you one who's in those spaces to start appreciating the good the bad and the ugly you know, yeah. worst, stinky mold the grime they all have a function, they all have a role, they all have a place. Right, right. It's all part of this, it's all part of existence, right? There's no need to, to push any of it away. Yeah, mate. Yeah. <laughs> Race it all. Yeah, they yeah. do, the yogis do. Anybody you mention yoga, I've mentioned yoga, the top yogis do. The gories that you find in southern India, they spend a lot of time like rolling around and shit, you know, rubbing it all over their skins and stuff, you know, <laughs> eating it in some cases, you know, like, well, you know, and they're the top yogis, you know, and they do a lot of stuff that I guess in general we would feel is grotesque and they have a phrase some people may have heard something along the lines of cleanliness is closer to godliness well the agoris the highest yogis suggest that filthiness is closer to the goddess brings you closer to the goddess so they have all the very much these taboo practices that most people wouldn't engage in on their day-to-day -day lives yeah. uh, consider the highest practices and forms of yoga 
you know, on tantric yoga and stuff, which is not sexualized in the way that the West has got it. It's all to do with developing a union within yourself and embracing everything, experiencing everything. There's there's no thing not to experience kind of thing. So yeah, yeah. man, they, they go there with, with that said, and they've got to go. There's no stone left un- unturned, as they say. Yeah, that's really interesting. I've also um, heard you speak before about the idea that, you know, like a lot of the time with psychedelics, people talk of them just about medicines, right, in the kind of Western context. But I've heard you say that they're kind of, you know, you can think of them as a tool that can be used as medicine in the right context, but you think of it more as like a technology, right? Most definitely. Like, just like any technology, it has it's multifunctional, you know. So the phone being one, I can just pick up, dial some numbers in there, and I can speak to somebody. I can now jump on the internet. I can measure, measure how far I've walked for the day. You know, it's a tool. It's so like, it can be used for different purposes. And I guess the phone could also be used as a form of medicine. I guess it can check your temperature now and tell you if you're sick. And so if you've got COVID or not, I don't know what this technology can do for you, but there's an organic technology and organic technologies that exist and have been existing that can do the same functions that a phone can do that a tv can do you know like our eyes and our ears we have organic technologies and then there's technologies that complement our own technology like psilocybin that enable you to open up other aspects or parts of your technology if you see yourself as a computer you know the mushrooms for example like usb data keys that you plug in you know you get the files you can download the files in my cloud let's say <laughs> you know you've got to store and process them the ones that don't serve you well you put in your recycling bin store up free up more data that might be your trauma that might be you know the baggage that luggage that you carry put that in the recycling bin reuse it get it back so you've got more gigabyte space so you're freed up and you can live a more free life so with that said that's how i would utilize it where back home in indigenous places it's a preventative measure so you're not seeing it as medicine but it's healing it prevented you from having depression anxiety and ptsd in the first place so then if you don't have those things and it's around you what are you utilizing those things for well for the most part indigenous cultures say that the technology is there for them to communicate with their ancestors it's a phone it's your plug in you can phone home you can phone home to where your ancestors are that's what mushrooms are that's what ayahuasca is that's what ebola what people who are gifted that stuff that's what they say it's there for in addition they've got rites of passages that they use for initiation they're using warriorship they're using acts of ritualistic you know celebrations that engage their gods or their ancestors you know so before anxiety depression ptsd alcohol recovery heroin addiction they're talking something else. Most of the people who was gifted this stuff about what it's there for. So it's more technology, as I understand it, than medicine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks so much, Darren. This has been really, really fun. I uh, really appreciate your time as well, James. Yeah, man. Yeah. Where would you send people to if they were looking to your work more? Um, they can follow me, darrenlebaron.com. That's my website. That's what I'm known on social media, on Facebook and Instagram. And I think that's pretty much what I do. I've got a YouTube channel as well. So if you just punch my name in any of those platforms, yeah, my page and stuff should come up and right. just follow, right. like, and whatever it is that you've got to do. <laughs> and we didn't get a chance to talk about it, but you run these amazing, like, uh, mushroom cultivation courses as well, right? I'd recommend people check those out. Yeah, that's right. Again, all of that information is available on my site. We've got the Shroom Shop Masterclass, which is a downloadable video. And I'm about to come back home soon, and I should be doing some in-person workshops too, man, which I'm looking forward to. Great. So, yeah, so get people caught up in. Great. All right. Thanks again, Darren. All right. Nice one, James, man. All the best. Thank you.